Very good afternoon, everyone. A very good Wednesday afternoon to everybody who's joining us here. Thank you for joining us for ICDM's webinar series. I hope that everyone's been having a good, productive week so far, uh, as we are sheltered at home and doing our part to flatten the curve. But it's been an interesting week full of very interesting insights, and today's topic in particular is one I think that's quite eye-opening. But before we start, just want to get some of the housekeeping out of the way. Um, if you've just joined, the mic is automatically muted and is your video but if you want to actually share your views and contact us you have you have avenues at the zoom tab at the bottom there is two tabs there is the Q&A and then there is the chat if you have any questions for our speaker please type it into the Q&A tab we've been having some really lively Q&A sessions and that has had been very very interesting and we will answer them at the end of his session but if you're having any technical difficulties, you want to give feedback. In fact, we, I think over the course of the week, we've seen, um, I think we've seen like book recommendations related to topics and everything. Please feel free to drop us in the chat. The whole session is recorded. We'll send you a copy after. If you wish to leave the webinar session, you may, but you can rejoin if it is still in progress. With that out of the way, let me introduce our speaker today, who is Ryan Lim, Principal Consultant and Founding Partner for QED Consulting Singapore. His topic, and one that's very close to me actually, is Rising Corporate Risks of Weaponized Fake News. I am massively passionate about this topic because fake news is a very big bugbear of mine. The way that we communicate these days, the speed at which we communicate these days, a click, a share, a pass, it's, it, it can be very dangerous and it can catch. I mean, the term, the term they use is viral and that's very, you know, that's very apt as things will, may be. But people never want to seem to verify it. But it becomes worse in cases like this when people are looking for reliable sources and it becomes even easier to get scammed. Worse even when people in power who know how to use this actually choose to use it in order to harm companies, in order to hurt reputations. That's what they mean by weaponized. And more than anything, I think companies definitely need to get in front of this because as I think from one particular movie said it, internet's actually written in pen and not pencil. But for more insight on that, I turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks for having us. And uh, for, to everyone out there, thanks for joining us. And I thought that this is actually a very interesting topic to share on. And especially why does it bother you at all, right? So I'll promise not to actually politicize anything. And I'll concentrate a lot on the impact and the worries and the rising concerns that the fake news uh, popularized by, of course, President Trump, um, to actually, what's the impact to you as board directors, as well as to corporations and senior management as well. Now, this is going to be a, a very lively discussion, I, I think, because, and I would like it to be a little bit more interactive, unlike most of what you might have already encountered. Uh, I want you to also participate as well. So to give you a bit of sensing as to what you think about the fake news part of it and all what are the issues uh, generally that has been out there as well, so that you will actually get a sensing of exactly what you're facing and hopefully maybe change your perspective and also change your mind about how things are and get you more prepared in terms of resilience moving forward. Okay, come, let's get started and allow me to share my screen. And if you have any particular questions, like uh, Nadia said, feel free to just uh, pop me a question and happy to be able to uh, answer them as best I can. Okay. Allow me to start off with a short poll. And I think Ezri is going to help me with that. Um, this particular poll is to ask everyone who's attending today to see exactly what you think is the impact to an organization that you're leading or a part of. Um, what's the business impact to you at this point of time? So why I'm asking this question, so please feel free to poll in. Um, it's anonymous, so it's quite fun to actually see what's the current situation like, what do you think, what's the impact of fake news? Because most of the time when we look at fake news, we always assume that it is very, very highly political. It is the domain of the government or public agencies only. So if you're not in that domain, usually we don't have to bother too much and there's very little impact. So a quick poll will be able to tell us exactly what's your current sensing. Um, there's no right or wrong in this particular question, but it would be good to be able to then hear from you and actually see exactly uh, as a poll from everyone here today, just to see, well, where we are at in terms of understanding what the risks that we're talking about. Okay, 
So while we are actually polling this, maybe a little short introduction while everyone puts in their decision. Um, more about us in terms of who I am and what I do. So I am Ryan again, um, as you, most of you have uh, already know. I'm actually the principal consultant as well as founder of QED Consulting. And we actually are a digital marketing and communications consultancy uh, specializing in two particular areas. One of them is to help organizations on, as well as governments realize their uh, business value when they invest in digital marketing and communications. Now, the other one, which is a very specialized track that we do is to mitigate the risk also in this set of investment today. So back in about 2011, what was very interesting is that we had clients coming up to us, asking us to actually not only just to manage their branding or their personal uh, profile, but to also position them because some of them has political ambitions. And that started off the whole journey for us to actually investigate what we could or what we could not do. And my goodness, it was a little bit like going down a bit of a rabbit hole. And that's our first encounter with fake news in a corporate setting, not so much only on the public, uh, political setting. And perhaps we can uh, quickly jump on to see what the results are before we move on to talk more about fake news and what it really means to companies in general. Ezri, can we take a look and see what the results are? Okay. So as you can see, uh, this the host have just shared the results on your screen. And if you can take a look at it, for those people who are calling in, um, well, the bulk of you are thinking, well, it's minor, uh, somewhat, if you look at it, about more than 50% think that, well, there is no much, not much of an impact, especially if it's not politically linked or otherwise. So allow me to then show you exactly what's going on. Now, let's go back to the sharing today. If you notice that fake news is not happening because of digital or because of Trump. Now, fake news has been happening for a very, very long time. Um, as early as in 1939, if you look at this particular picture here, this is Stalin and one of the photo shots and screens that have been taken where he has his lieutenant down there. His name is Nicholas Yakov. Now, Nicholas Yakov, if you look at it, he's on the right. So this is the gentleman here. Now, because he fell out with Stalin at some point of time in his career, he was actually removed from the picture and the archives. So they don't have digital back then. So how did they do it? So what they did a lot of was that they actually used painters to actually paint over the film itself and then to reconstitute uh, the entire photo itself. So that you can call it propaganda or otherwise, but it's been around since 1939. So it's nothing new at all. But with the advent or, or rather the penetration of mobile devices as well as the internet, you find that this is increasingly become a problem because, well, it is so easy to propagate, easy to create and easy to share. Now to take things into context, if you look at just in Malaysia itself, uh, just on COVID-19, which is the pandemic that we now all face uh, globally, you find that COVID-19 related investigations, and these are the ones which are either at the state level or at the national level, it's, there is already about 220 investigations going on. Now, this does not include those fake news that has nothing to do with the state, but rather corporate fake news or some other things that impact the small business owners or otherwise as well. So if you take a look at this uh, particular uh, blown up part of the article itself, you'll notice there's about 220 investigations as of April 16, uh, according to uh, the senior minister of MCMC. So this is just related to COVID-19 fake news. We're not even talking about everything else uh, in totality. So now, that, which then brings us to the elephant in the room. Now, before we talk about it, allow me to introduce you to a term known as what we call the black elephant. Okay, now the black elephant is a very interesting corporate term uh, coined by Peter Ho, which is one of the senior strategists and top civil servant of Singapore. So he calls it a black elephant because it is a crossbreed between a black swan and an elephant in the room. So this is the risk that you are about to face, right? So where corporations are not aware of it, or at least seems to have an understanding that yes, fake news might have an impact. So that's the elephant in the room that we are not addressing. We do not know what the impact is. And we ignore it long enough until it becomes a catastrophe um, that and evolves into what we call the black swan. So we need to be able to mitigate that risk in general. Now, when we talk about fake news, I know that you've probably seen a lot of uh, presentations and webinars that talk about them, but I'm going to do something slightly different this time. 
why not I show you how we can create fake news live on a webinar? I don't get to see a lot of webinars creating fake news live in front of the people who attend so that you can see exactly what we are facing today. Okay, I'm gonna change the screen so that you can see exactly what I'm about to do. Okay, just give me a second. Okay, so this is the star and a, a, a news publication. And just to show you that this is actually a real site and not something that I've really pre-photoshopped. This is one of the announcement on the 21st of April that has yet to decide whether or not the MCO, the movement control order in Malaysia is about to be extended. And I understand that this particular extension will only come in, I think later this Friday. But how about if I were to just maybe edit this new site right in front of you right about now? Okay, instead of yet to decide, has decided. How about that? So for those of you who are actually looking at, you can see the screen for another, say for example, four weeks. And all you need to do right now is to perhaps even take a screenshot of this and start sharing across your WhatsApp and all your closed networks. And this is how easy it's done. At the click of a button, you can actually start um, altering, altering and maybe manipulating websites. And you can literally take screenshots of this to be able to share it around and cause sufficient panic or enough of this uh, fake news, if you will. Now, maybe I can also share some things like maybe on the edge, I think that's where Nadia is from. And you can literally maybe even discredit or change headlines so that it looks very similar or even very believable. So instead of the CIMB group having exposure, which was reported also on the 21st, you can actually start to implicate, say, for example, the CEO. So in changing, or changing the CIMB group, you can just type in, oops, C oh, oops, sorry, just give me a second. CEO, there you go. And there you go. You've just implicated the CEO of a CIMB in a news article, which is actually legitimate. So this is how easy it took me like maybe uh, uh, less than a minute to be able to do that. Just a bit of creativity involved. And well, it cost me nothing to be able to do that, maybe except for about five minutes of my time. Now, this is the kind of implication or the problem that we face when it comes to fake news creation. It is extremely easy to do. You do not need any coding capabilities. You just need to have a browser, internet access, and a couple of clicks away. Now, there's another type of uh, fake news that I'm going to create and show you as well. This is what we call the fabrication of WhatsApp messages. And I thought it would be quite fun to actually do it. So in this particular uh, example that I'm showing you, I'm going to fabricate a conversation that's going on between a CEO and someone else that he's concerned about. So maybe I can just put in um, an example of maybe the CEO of a telco like uh, hmm, Cellcom. Okay, let's try that. And if you look at it, I've just changed the name and the name appears exactly as it is. And to make it a little bit more believable, I'll just upload his picture that I've gotten. Right, and his picture appears here. And I know that he will definitely not use uh, Vodafone. I'll then use Cellcom. And if you can then change some of the battery options, maybe he's used his battery a lot and he's got 31% now. And I can change the connection and say that instead of uh, Wi-Fi, he'll definitely be on 4G and change the message as I please. So if you look at it, I can start changing messages right in front of you and voila. Okay, how I you and that's it. Okay, just add to that and it appears. So as you can see, I'm gonna leave it there and I'll leave it the rest to your imagination. And if you notice, it is extremely easy to be able to fabricate uh, email conversations between people through WhatsApp or any other medium itself, and then spread it out to discredit and fabricate and discredit uh, key targets of what we call individuals to be able to then cause chaos as well as confusion, not only amongst the key stakeholders, the employees, but also the general public and authorities in general. So you can actually cause into a lot of mischief. And again, all these services are available online, easily accessible and cost no more than a coffee or, or, or your time to be able to get as creative as possible to then go about discrediting uh, different types of people or your different targets. 
So let's get back to it. I mean, I've scared you enough <laughs> if, if I have um, to show you exactly what are the threats that we are facing. And these are just two of the many that uh, weapons that can be weaponized. And I wanted to just show you how easy uh, it is done so that you have a much deeper understanding and appreciation of what those fake news uh, weapons are. So we've defaced it. We can fabricate WhatsApp chats. Now, if you look at it, there's also a third one. And in the interest of time, you can actually scan and see the actual account, which we've uh, demonstrated using a particular uh, website and, and uh, on Instagram. And we did it for a documentary regionally where we wanted to showcase that you don't even need to hack into a particular system. You can literally fabricate, you can buy comments, you can buy hate comments, love comments. And if you scan the uh, QR code that you see right in front of you right now, you can actually be able to see uh, the actual fake piece of content that we have put up by a person that doesn't exist. And you can pay people to say whatever they want about that piece of uh, content. In other words, you can literally make and play an algorithm so that it makes it very, very uh, interesting or it gets picked up as a trending piece of information across Facebook, Instagram, and, you, and even, uh, for example, Twitter to allow a lot of people to see more of the content that you want them to see, literally manipulating what is actually visible to the people today. So if you can uh, see this particular picture that we've, I've just shared with you, this particular picture is actually what we call a uh, farm or you want to call it a click bot farm, um, which you can then buy all sorts of engagement metrics that we have to literally game the algorithm of all these social media and digital platforms in order to increase visibility of the types of content that we want them to see. In other words, whatever you're seeing on social media today could have actually been manipulated by what we call coordinated uh, efforts in some form or the other. Okay, so the point I wanted to bring to you with that demonstration is that it is extremely easy to actually execute it. You do not need coding skills. A single individual could have pulled it off and to make matters a little bit more complicating, it is very, very accessible today. So in other words, when we look at the problem, we keep thinking, or the fallacy is that we assume that the problem is always uh, state-sponsored, or you need to have a lot of resources like a syndicate, a very powerful syndicate, to be able to execute this particular fake news attack, as you will. But the, it's actually further, far from the truth, if you will. So now, but why would anyone want to employ fake news? Now, if you look at it, there are three major issues that we do uh, understand a lot about that actually drives the utility of fake news. And one of them, as I've just shown, it is extremely easy to exploit. So it is easy to access, easy to create. The next one, it is extremely hard to detect, which we will then do a little bit of a test with everyone here today, just to see whether or not you can actually discern, because most of the time we assume, as well as the fact checkers, they always want to tell us that you can do fact checking it is easy to discern. So let's put that to the test as well at, uh, in this webinar. And the last but not least is actually that it is extremely cheap to execute. So in other words, almost anyone can actually execute a fake news attack. And if that's true, and what is really worrying is that that means we, when we look at bad actors in this particular space, we are not and should not be only looking at what we call state-sponsored attacks. We should be looking at bad actors that could potentially be an inside job. It could be one of your disgruntled employees. It could be a competitor. It could be what we call investor activism. Uh, investors who are not happy about our organization then goes around spreading fake news to then discredit and also to erode the trust of the consumers and the public to the organization itself. So now let's put it to the test and see whether or not you can tell the difference between truth and fiction. Now, I have several headlines right now, and I wanted you to uh, look at all these four headlines. Uh, I think it's about four or five headlines. And then based on your understanding, which I pulled off from some of these websites, uh, news websites, to tell me which are real and which are not. The first one is that the police advise residents not to respond to harassment letters from Lord Voldemort. The next one is Jet Li congratula uh, congratulating Halima Yaakob, which is Singapore's first female Malay president. Um, say that she's flattered and that she's a fan. Policeman accused of illegally buying Prata to buy Roti Chanai, responding to public nuisance case, and immigration checkpoint installs a few tank scanner. So 
please start the poll and uh, we'll see whether or not you can tell which is fake. You can choose any of these four. Now, the interesting thing that what's been going on, and I think that the challenge that a lot of people are facing today is that we think that when you share a piece of news and it's discovered that it is fake, um, people always think that, oh, that's because you don't know enough, you're silly, or you're not smart, therefore you are forwarding um, fake pieces of content on social media, on uh, WhatsApp, on Telegram. But I wanted to share with you that it may not be true. It is not as easy to discern as you can see from this particular example. And these are real, real examples which are very challenging because you'll find that a lot of people tend to mix what we call half truths, which complicates the matter. So which part is true and which part is not? And a major part of this is actually dealing with what we call uh, consumer behaviors. And if you notice or, or heard of this particular phrase known as what we call clickbait, um, the consumer behavior actually plays a very large role in actually causing confusion and to be able to uh, amplify the propagation of fake news. Now, I hope that most of you have actually given it a try and hopefully be able to tell us which is true and which is not. And then we should be able to then see some of the results and then discover whether or not by right, all of us should be able to tell. It should be easy, right? At least that's what the fact checkers keep telling us. Okay. Um, Ashwik, maybe you can show us how the results are like. Thank you so much. Ah, okay, quite even. So uh, which of the statements are fake? It's quite even at almost like a quarter of each or one of, uh, of each of these particular statements. Now, allow me to then show you which are real and which are not. Okay, the first three headlines are real. The last one is false. No prizes for guessing why, okay? So if you, <laughs> if you notice, right, it is extremely challenging. So in other words, 75% of us may not be able to get it all the time. So that's the challenging part. It is not easy to discern. And if we keep telling people to discern or to be able to say, hey, look, use, uh, use a little bit more logic, it will fail us 75% of the time. If you look at the current experiment that we just had. Now, this is extremely challenging. In other words, we cannot use this approach and it is not as easy as it seems. Now, what could go wrong? And I wanted to show you some of the scenarios that we've picked up and where possible, we try to put it in the Malaysian context as well so that it is more relevant um, to you. So let's look at the first one. If you notice, unlike cyber attacks, um, information attacks or information warfare, or sometimes also known as fake news, actually has what we call offline consequences. Unlike cyber attacks, cyber attacks are primarily online consequences. You lost data, theft of data, data has been manipulated. But with fake news, you can literally move people on the ground based on the information that you're spreading out. So it's not too difficult to actually imagine. Say, for example, if you have fake pieces of news talking about things like COVID-19 being a lockdown in a particular area, as in this particular case with the Shah Alam Section 6, you find that you can literally move people or block certain areas which have offline consequences as well. You can make people avoid particular locations. You can literally disrupt operations by saying there's a bomb threat in a building somewhere. It's not too far off to be able to pull it off with just maybe a single WhatsApp, a tweet, a Facebook message, or even screenshots that is being shared around. So you find that it is a much bigger problem uh, to face with. The other uh, example that we have, and this one happened in London not too long ago on 13th of May 2019, was that there was a bank run uh, by Metro Bank. And what has happened was that there was a false rumor floating around on WhatsApp saying that the bank is about to run out of money. And this is the picture of the people rushing off to withdraw their deposits. Uh, although Metro Bank survived this, the thing to take note is that all it took was a WhatsApp message. And the content or the information must be somewhat believable. Most people will not fact check. And you will notice this is an actual offline consequence because if there's enough people, the press will pick it up, which then further aggravates the problem. Think about this. Will your corporate communications be able to handle something like this? They are not structured currently. Most organizations are not structured currently to be able to tackle this because you can't go for a press release. It doesn't do anything uh, more than just getting the press. And that's if the press will even pick it up unless it is not even, say, for example, if it's not state-related news and it's just a fake news bothering one particular organization, they may not even give it enough airtime to refute or to rebut the fake news that's been going on. 
Now, the other problem that we started to see is what we call an online spoofing or identity theft. And the bigger the organization, the higher the profile of the key management team or stakeholders, you find that you have a very large digital footprint and it's extremely easy to be able to fabricate all sorts of things that's going on to discredit not only the individual, but also the organization itself. So this is a very recent case uh, in Singapore, which is the Tamasek CEO of Ho, Ho Ching actually um, had to refute and rebut one of the claims that were false. Now, this one is not an online fake piece of news. This was an actual uh, TV show in Taiwan that claims that she has a 100 million uh, a year salary. And of course, that well, the Minister of uh, Ministry of Finance actually came out to say that, look, this is fake, it's not real. Uh, it is not determined that way. Her, sal sal her salaries are not determined that way as well. So one of the fallacies that we have is that we keep thinking that fake news is always started by online sources, which is not true. Fake news can actually be coming from anywhere, propagated and spread mostly online. So that's the real issue that we face today. Now, some of you might say, okay, maybe because uh, Ho Ching happens to be the wife of our prime minister and therefore a little bit political. Yeah, that might be true. Let's go on to other examples to say, well, who else may, could, um, may be subject to or victimized by such an attack? So Jeff Bezos, I'm sure you all know, uh, which is the CEO of Amazon, you find that he's also been quoted to talk about uh, different COVID-19 issues, if you will. And there were a lot of uh, fake claims that Mr. Bezos sent messages to Africans about COVID-19. And like you said, even uh, the Bill Gates was involved in some form or the other. So you find that all these things will happen and they will always target the senior management team because they're soft target. Now, I may not have shared it here. The other problem that we are seeing as an attack vector is that they no longer just attack the C-suiters. They will now also attack the family members, the immediate family members, because the immediate family members are softer targets, easier targets. So they'll discredit what we call by proxy. When we discredit the family, the family will then bring ill repute to the management stakeholders. The management stakeholders will then uh, cause problems in terms of reputation as well as trust to the organization itself. So they are all interlinked and it is never a direct attack. Now, for small medium business owner, this was just reported on the 14th of April, where you find that a hawker, which is a small business owner, lodges a report about fake news of her being tested positive. Now, how hard is it to imagine this being changed as the headline goes like this instead, and it is your CEO that has been the victim of this. So you'll find that it is extremely easy to fabricate and you will start to cause a lot of problems when individuals are being attacked and we are not actually uh, helping to manage the actively manage the digital footprint as well as the reputation of our key stakeholders. Now it is not limited only to individuals. You notice that some of these fake news attacks actually goes on where it is very highly competitive. So like Samsung has been fined before for faking comments. So they hired a PR agency to do what we call smear campaigns because it's very competitive. And you find that, well, this has happened and this happened as early as 2013. And by the way, this is the one that got caught. There are a lot of others which is not reported. And not only Samsung, there's another company that you may have heard of, Facebook. So Facebook themselves has, was actually exposed um, in smearing Google in its earlier days back in 2011. So these are the ones that got caught. There are others which we may not have seen. And you realize that in the commercial sector, they do do a lot of this because it is extremely competitive. And these are the activities best that money can buy. Now, since everyone is on Zoom or we have telecommuting. And if you like to see this particular video, which I'm about to show you right now, you can either scan the QR code or maybe click on the link. Allow me to just show you what the video is all about. So imagine you are having a Zoom conference that's going on with your colleagues and this happens. Elon Musk. Yes. Uh, 
It's like I got into the wrong conference because how are you doing guys? Uh good. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm nice. Thank you. Nice. Nice hair color by the way. Thank you. <laughs> well then have a nice day. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. 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 Have a nice day. <laughs> Okay, of course, you know that this is definitely not uh, Elon Musk calling into your Zoom call. But that call to be able to have Elon Musk call you is actually widely circulated right now and it's available in Avatify. So these kind of codes are now easily accessible that anyone can actually produce or create uh, fake news, what we call deep fakes of key targets who can then jump into a conference call, make certain statements that they have not done so. And on, not only to discredit, they may have certain implications to an organization if a CEO makes odd statements. Now, this is another case that I wanted to show you where we talk about voice manipulation. We've talked about image manipulation. We talk about deep fix, which is video. This one is audio manipulation. So if you look at some of the tools that's out there today, uh, Adobe has a couple of tools that they've just released. I think it's still in the beta stage where you can actually manipulate the voice of anyone as long as you have a five to 10 minute clip of someone speaking of another topic, for example. You can literally put words into the person's mouth. And in this particular case, there was a fraudulent transaction using a uh, adulterated voice of the CEO who then made that transition. I think the entire transaction was about quarter of a million that was lost as a result. The money was actually moved out quite quickly because it was voiced over a phone call that uh, approved the transaction that was about a quarter million that then went ahead. So this is the kind of impact that we are facing with fake news. It is no longer just images. We are talking about voice manipulation, video manipulation, and the problem can get quite worse. Now with all this, maybe I can then shape our thinking a little bit by going into what are the vulnerabilities then and what the risk areas that we should be very, very concerned about. Now, if you look at it, allow me to define the difference between cyber attacks and information attacks. Now, I'm going to use information attacks or info attacks interchangeably with fake news because fake news is popularized by Trump. Most people understand what it is, but the actual technical term is info attacks. So for cyber attacks, most of the time, these are infrastructure or technical related. So if there's programming related, you have a cyber attack. Now, if it's perception related, where you're manipulating, creating, uh, taking things out of context, that's usually what we call perception related, like a bad rumor. Now, what we've seen some of the uh, bad actors out there, what they're employing is not cyber or info attacks purely, but a combination and that's where the dangerous part comes in of both cyber and information attacks at the same time against a target. So information, like it or not, does harm. It's not just data. So if it's false information, but it is not intentional, we have classification known as what we call misinformation. Now, if it's false and intentional, this is disinformation. If it's intentional but true, then it is called an expose. All three types of content or information can actually harm an organization. So when we talk about fake news, we are overgeneralizing. And for the team that actually handling the operators or the manage or the team that is fighting the fake news, need to be able to then to be able to break them out, discern which one they fall under, so that you can then measure the response. Otherwise, you're reacting to everything into one huge big bucket. And I think that by itself is a mistake. So What's the problem for corporations then? Now, if you look at this information attacks, you don't need a lot of resources as I've shared with you and you've seen for yourself. It maybe take a cup of coffee and you can cause massive damage. You don't need tech skills. You need to know how to open up a browser and click some buttons. And it is extremely accessible, which means that anyone can launch an attack. However, if you contrast it to a cyber attack, you need to have somewhat a, a syndicate or a state level resources to be able to execute that. You need to have very good hacking uh, programming skills, which is few and far between. And you need to go to places like the dark web to be able to launch in terms of accessibility. So if you were to compare the two of them together, you realize that disinformation versus uh, cyber attacks, there is a much bigger attack surface when it comes to fake news or disinformation attacks itself. Now, where are the areas that this fake news normally attack an organization? Where what we've seen so far, 
these are the traditional channels that we see. These are all systems. They are all in place for most organizations. However, thanks to new technologies like smartphones, internet access, and all the apps that we have, software as a service, they are all shining a very harsh light to old systems or what we call legacy systems. And as a result, we find that there's a lot of exposed problems that we have yet to patch up. Our current response processes when it comes to emergencies and uh, the problems that we face is not ready or the perception, the perspective, it's not to deal with this in this particular manner because we are thinking that the world is still very much uh, reputational based, which you notice that the way they go about attacking, it's a lot more complicating than before. So these are the old system that currently right now requires a lot of review and audits to be able to know exactly how susceptible they are when a fake news attack does happen. Now, rather than just telling you the problems itself, maybe I can also share a little bit about a basic or base framework that you can actually consider to look at what when dealing with this, what we call the unknown risk that's coming or associated with fake news. Now, for those of you who want this particular uh, slide, I think you can reach out to the team at ICDM. We can share this. Um, this is a base disinformation resilience framework that we use. If you notice this, there's a 5P ranging from perspective to your plans, to your processes, your policies, as well as your people that needs to be updated with a new view that fake news can be a potential huge problem that corporate and commercial organizations may also face. It's already happening in the US. It will happen to us in, in a matter of time. So if you look at the perspective itself, you can actually look at reframing our understanding of what the risk and threats out there. I've only shown you two of out of 20 that we have actually encountered, we are actively being used. We have to look at some of our response or crisis plans to uncover all these what we call blind spots because a lot of PR agencies today don't look at it the same way we do because they look at the threat as still very reputational. That's traditional understanding. We've gone far beyond that with the bad actors. And look at the processes in terms of response. We have not actually looked at it that particular way. Do we always go for press releases or are there other ways to actually tackle the problem? And not only policies, policies need to cover both in-house when it comes to employees and vendors, but also policies that deals with all the key stakeholders, including the consumers out there today. And last but not least, our people. Are they ready to understand what's going on so that they can be of help to the organization rather than to be a problem or to add on to it as well? So if you look at the different things, we've got trainings that you have to do, you've got rate teaming exercise. Now, allow me to explain a little bit about rate teaming uh, shortly after this. And of course, we've covered things like audits of the current response or known attack vectors and policies. What are the areas that we need to cover? We need to talk to your lawyers to be able to update quite a bit of those, including your HR policies, your external policies as well, dealing with, or governance, if you will, dealing with the public at large. And also with consumers or your employees coming to join you, they should be a part of the defense mechanism and not isolated as people who are just victims of it. So let me cover a little bit of details of the, the baseline. So with disinformation attacks, there are some of these master classes that are available, but they are very subjected to uh, clearance because the know-how is very dangerous. And normally for organizations who send their, their employees for such training, these employees need to sign an agreement, a legal agreement with the, the uh, employers because ultimately once they have been trained, they will be extremely dangerous as well. So we need to have some accountability when it comes for this kind of operational training. We have what we call rate teaming exercises. Now rate teaming exercises are something that is adopted from the military where you adopt the stance of a attacker and you will then design uh, scenarios where you attack an organization much like the white hackers, if you will, the ethical hackers, where we look at what are the vulnerable spots, high risk areas or probable, probable areas, and we design a campaign that can see whether or not how the organization can respond should an attack happen in this particular manner. Of course, these kind of designs cannot just be a creative campaign that is being designed, but it also needs to be what we call evidence-based, which means that if you design this particular attack campaign or tactic, it needs to be proven that it can be done as well. 
Now, the audit then comes in because there are a lot of what we call uh, recognized attack vectors. So your team needs to be able to say, okay, if these attack vectors are coming to organization, what can we do about it? So it's a real assessment of well, how ready we are in terms of the processes itself. Not only that, we should also do an audit of the readiness of the employees. When they see a piece of fake news, for example, what do they do? Do they escalate it to the right channels or they spread it to their friends and family to make the matters worse? So this kind of exercises can be done. And a lot of the banks from the financial institutions are already doing it from the cyber, uh, cyber resilience point of view. Why not extend this to the fake news or the disinformation pod point of view as well? So then knowing where the problem areas are, you can start to design countermeasures that are suitable for your organizations because not all sorts of attacks that are possible are probable to your organization itself. So you have to start working when nothing has happened to you in a blue sky scenario. We also need to update what we call uh, the responses. And there are different tactics that is, needs to be employed and press releases don't cut it. And we are having worked with a lot of the uh, government sectors as well, the private entities who are concerned about this, we realize that if you look at this particular slide itself, there are different means of addressing a very new problem. It means changing our perspective as well, our lens, and also what we call the risk tolerance when dealing with such a problem. Last but not least, if you think about this, we must also have what we call the corporate reaction. And we need to be able to assess how vulnerable we are at this current point of time should a fake news attack us, rather than to assume that we will be okay once our plans and processes are in place. So just to share with you things like how we actually do town halls and maybe uh, uh, five pointers to not, not, not scare our employees, but to actually help them inoculate them. This is like a, a short example of things that we do share a lot uh, within the employees so that they can be part of the resilience effort in to inoculate the organization as well as the employees themselves so that we are not so um, subjected to the amplification and damages that can come from a fake news attack. All right, so one last thing, I'm about to come to the end of this as well. This is actually a real piece of fake news that was created in Yibin, China. And this terribly Photoshopped picture caused enough panic that people were calling the police station in Sichuan. And this particular so-called dragon, which if you look at it, is actually a snake. Uh, is known as the Sichuan earthquake dragon who was blamed for the earthquake that happened in Sichuan. So now, another poll for you. How old do you think the person was that created this piece of fake news? So there are three groups of people that we normally would blame for creation of fake news, right? So if just vote for it. There are only three categories that you can know. Yeah. So under 21, you're assuming that they are in the teens or the millennials and their students. The working group, which is the 21 to 49, uh, the people, okay, I've been mindful about that, who are a little bit more mature, 50 years old and above, are the ones who are also getting blamed for it. So who do you think is responsible and possibly having the capabilities to create a piece of fake news like this? They, cre um, they cause a little bit of panic in Sichuan, uh, China, that the police had to arrest this person. No, this is a very interesting one because if you notice, um, Let's look at our assumptions and see who could be the problem areas that we have missed out so far. All right, come. Okay, so every, um, actually, can you share what the results are? Okay, so the bulk of us would have normally and quickly associated that the suspect who was responsible for creating pieces piece of fake news as 40, uh, 40, 47% of them is the students, right? They are creative and they're capable of doing such things. They have the access and the know-how. Well, the actual fact, it was done and created by a 50-year-old who was trying his newly acquired Photoshop skills. So <laughs> this is the kind of problem that we face. You find that the people who are above 50 who need not to be very technically savvy can create fake news for us and cause enough panic and damage to organizations. Now, some of you might have said that, well, Ryan, maybe this is in Sichuan, right? Um, in, in China. But that's the problem. Uh, an attacker can come like this and all it takes is a laptop, a credit card, and the internet. This helps us reframe the problem where it is not always state-sponsored or a syndicate. It could be a competitor. 
it could be an employee, it could be a retiree, it could be students, it could be a, 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 a anyone who has a, an axe to grind against a particular organization. Now to bring the issue back closer to Malaysia so that you have a great sense of it, whether or not maybe in China, all the people have the skills uh, much older perhaps. Now, this is in Malaysia on the 29th of January where there was an arrest of fake news. And if you look at this very interesting piece of uh, news itself, they caught one of them who was arrested for creating fake news on the COVID-19 issue was actually 49 years old. So if you look at it, that means almost anyone could be a creator of fake news. And we should be very, very worried as a result of it. So I hope that this particular sharing and presentation would open your perspective, change your perspective a little as well, and to know that, that we are extremely vulnerable. It is not just public uh, organizations, but private organizations as well. And we should prepare for it because it is not if, but only a matter of time of when it might happen to us. So I would end this particular sharing so that we can leave enough time for questions. And I see that there are a couple, and maybe we can uh, clarify some of the issues and concerns that you might have. Right. Thank you very much, Ryan. I think you've sufficiently scared all of them at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it wasn't your intention, but yes, it, it can actually, when it happens real time in front of you, I think it is quite jarring to probably a lot of people who didn't realize it could be quite so easy because we even got one comment saying, how did you do that? Like you are some, they basically they're asking you to kind of show your tricks. I mean, okay, uh, on a more serious note, I did mention at the beginning that, that fake news is a very big issue and not just because the, the great, what do you call it, the, the guy in, in America says it is, but he uses it in the opposite way, although he himself actually perpetuates a lot of fake news. But this right. weaponizing of it, we know how fast it can go, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, is, and I think one, um, Munira actually has this very good question where they said, how does one decide whether to pair a statement in reply to fake news? You were talking about corporate communications team, right? Getting right. things out to the press. That doesn't work anymore or it's not as fast anymore. Because the, she mentions that sometimes addressing fake news will just fan the flame further. And we've seen this. Mm -hmm. People jump over the initial statement. They make a gigantic hoo-ha about it. But the apology that comes three days later gets almost nothing. Or they get a quarter of the views or the rage or you know, everybody wants to justify. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me frame that question a little bit as well. You're assuming that the press release would work. You have to do it, but it cannot be your only response. And that's where I think we are falling short. The current thinking for a lot of corporate communication or PR agencies assumes that the press would pick up uh, the, the piece of news and people will understand or want to read the correction notice or the, the, the validation of it. But you must know that bad news travel three times faster and wider than any good piece of news that is out there today. So while Correct. you can prepare the statement, um, one thing you need to know is that you need to be able to then propagate your side of the story. You're not here to refute that, say, I'm right or you're wrong, because there is always 10% of the populace who will always believe you. There's 10% of the populace who will never believe you. There's the 80% sitting in between, not really deciding uh, and not too sure, unless they see both sides of the story. I mean, if I see a piece of news, I would like to hear what's on the other side as well. And then to be able to come to some form of judgment. That's the real yeah. battlefield. So we need to be able to design our uh, propagation means to understand the techniques that are currently being used to propagate that piece of information. It may not be a press release or press statement all the time. That's necessary, but not the only channel. We have what we call the uh, digital coordination of propagation. So like what we call uh, engagement pods. This is a technique that is actually currently being used by uh, some of these influencers out there. So when you put a piece of news, you ensure that sufficient people like that piece of news or engage with that piece of news, therefore forcing and playing the algorithm so that it gets publicity and airtime. So that you mix it up a little bit so that your side of the story gets out there as well. And then you balance the view out there. You're not here to refute it completely, you can't. That's the most realistic thing I can say. However, you should be able to balance the conversation to get your side of the story out just as much. And you may need more than just organic uh, pushing, which means that you work for free and just put it out there. Uh, you might want to also push it, give it a little bit of push, amplify it, 
uh, with, with your resources that you have, and which is not traditional PR thinking. They will just say, put out the statement and let the rest pick it up if they are interested. Okay, I get that. So there has to be a very active way of making sure that it gets out there into the sphere, that your narrative gets what it gets told, right? Yes. So if, if I can bring off one of the most uh, studied coordination of fake news for propagation. So what they did was that they actually have uh, a whole network of volunteers. They also have a whole network of what we call the architect. They have the uh, group leaders or what we call like cell leaders that actually gets that piece of news. So it literally makes that if you create a piece of news, it gets spread out to the different networks. The different networks that then spread it even further, they are what we call paid and volunteers as well. You must know that the kind of techniques that are currently being employed so that you can also refute you employing those techniques where possible uh, to actually balance the conversation that's going out down there. Francis Poe actually asks, so of course now we know that mischief makers can manipulate, fabricate deep fake news, but how do you validate something? I think that's the biggest thing, right? It's like, how do we make sure that it is, that it is fake? How do you validate something? Okay, so one of the things that I shared earlier was that discernment doesn't work. So fact checking has its limits. And you see, with fact checkings, you must have something to uh, verify against. And that verification that you're making against needs to be trusted as a trusted source. So it's extremely difficult. We've checked with fact checkers. Fact checkers take approximately uh, about, I think anything from three hours to three weeks to verify. So imagine if it's three weeks, you're a goner. It doesn't work that way. So we wow. realized that, okay, you cannot fight facts with facts like this. You need to then understand how consumers think. That's consumer behavior. You need to actually start to learn to build inoculation habits. Instead of refuting and verifying based on facts, the consumer and the general public at large needs to have better habits. And I think we need to spend more areas of our efforts and resources getting people to have better habits uh, rather than to, uh, uh, for example, just jump to conclusions quickly as well. Or maybe a habit to check uh, alternative views before you come to any form of decision. So instead of verifying, is to actually ask them to build better habits than don't, not only maybe just verify, maybe just to say, hey, look, it's too good to be true. So there is a particular uh, keyword that, or rather a phrase that we've been advising some of our organizations that we have consulted for. We always say, there, it may be a simple phrase as sure or not. Uh, this is a very Singapore thingy, you know. It, it, whatever you see, question the thing, sure or not. And the Finns have done it to great effect. In other words, they will never take anything at surface value. Never. Now, it's a double-edged sword, you know. In other words, if you want to say the right stuff and you really want people to know about it, they will ask you sure or not as well. It will apply. So it's a double-edged right. sword and you want to implement that. But you need to build new habits, not discernment. I, 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 completely, I completely agree with that. I think that we have to be more mindful of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, say, like you say, sure or not, true or not. I mean, that's the easiest way. Nick, and on that question, Nikki G, and we have another anonymous question as well. Nikki G actually says, how do we educate senior leaders to be able to distinguish between sensationalization of news and fake news? And how do you make sure that the right kind of reaction is shown or carried out to mitigate such actions? An mm. anonymous person actually asks, but in that case, if it does happen to you, how do you handle something like fake news that has been specifically targeted towards bringing your company down? So it, it's, it's a double-handed thing, right? How do you make sure your senior management knows when you're, what do you call it, when you're being targeted? What do you do when it does? Okay, so um, with fake news, to be able to detect it is an extremely difficult thing. And with fake news, you can only prepare uh, before it happens, not during when it happens as well. There's no way you can fight a piece of fake news. And if you treat fake news as a bad office rumor, you will know that even if you found out who it is, if the person denies it, you're going to have a hard time trying to get the person to own up. So with bad rumors, right, that message is out there. One of the interesting things to get management, senior management team to, to understand the problem is to, well, like say, get them into a briefing room like this, where you actually know and perform it live and to show them live, they say, look, it's that easy. We've got a problem before it becomes one of those black swan events, let's do something about it and get our teams ready at least. Now, to be able to detect that it's been happening to a particular target, 
uh, say for example, the individuals, most of the time, if it happens to you, you'll know it very quickly because your friends and family will alert you. So you know that you're a victim. Um, and, That's quite uh, true. So they will be the first to know. And I, I'm, I'm sure that if they are a target, you will get your budget to actually get the resources going to make sure that you can refute it and get the things corrected as well. What I think needs to happen is that um, they need to know that the response, it's not conventional. So if you've seen the earlier slide, uh, which I think most people can share, that you need to map it out where is it believable and is it probable and high impact to your organization if you need to be able to tier them accordingly as well. Because not all pieces of fake piece of news is of material impact to an organization. Say for example, yeah. and I use myself, right? If you say that um, Ryan is extremely fat, uh, which I hope I'm not, okay? So <laughs> at least, so, and it, it's a piece of fake news, but it's immaterial to the organization. So you can have, you can then grade the response and say, okay, it is probable, it's believable, but it has have no high impact to it. Then I will grade my responses correctly. And that kind of what we call the governance of, uh, or policy of reaction policies that we have needs to be mapped out much earlier where we mapped out high probability, uh, high impact, or, low impact, but high probability, and then we will grade the response accordingly and prepare way before the incident happens, get the buy-in so that you get the commitment of resources to develop it as well, and then commit to developing it and trial, trial run it as well. So if uh, some Pushpa and I actually asked, uh, this is related to your slides from earlier, can mm. you just give us a little bit more on the responses being basically the inoculate, the refute, the ignore, and the bury? Is it, you basically just gave us a, a sketchy, what I call it, a sketched outline, but can you go a little bit more into it for us? Sure. Okay, so if, if you look at it, sometimes if things are inoculated, for example, okay, I just give a, keep a couple of examples because it's going to go into a whole lecture if I actually dive into the entire thing, right? So you yeah. want, uh, please come back to ICDM for some of our courses and we'll, we'll discuss more on that in detail. So interestingly enough, if you look at things like, for example, to refute in, and, or to inoculate, so let's start with inoculate. So if it's, uh, it's not very high impact to organization, you know it's out there, um, you inoculate the populace means that everybody knows that exists. It is not a major concern anyways. So you are inoculating the populace by, you don't have to hide it. You have to make sure that people know that it exists. It is a non-event and that's inoculation. Yeah. And it depends on who you are trying to address, who are the stakeholders that you're trying to address. It can be the consumers, it can be the public, it can be your stakeholders. You need to inoculate them that yes, it exists, but it has no impact, no material impact. Now there are certain things where we bury, which means that it is, very low probability, but it has potential impact to organization. And if you understand how the digital space work, burying it means that you need to, you can't delete it because there is no delete button, right? You write, like you rightly mentioned, it's a pen, it's not a pencil. There is no erase. Um, there are certain activities that you can invest in to make sure that it is extremely difficult to find. Um, interestingly enough, the good guys have to be able to use the same tools that the bad guys use. And this is, human psychology and consumer behavior as well. Ask yourself, when you are checking search engine results, how many pages do you plow through before you stop? I think maybe two, three pages at the most. Now, what happens- Yeah, if, that's quite true. Yeah, it's about two, three pages, right? Now, what happens if that piece of result has been buried 20 pages down? It's still there. You didn't oh. delete it. Okay. So in other words, there are different strategies at play that you can actually protect yourself as well in terms of inoculation and like Barry, which I've just given you one of those case examples as well, which you can invest in, but that thinking has to change. Your tactic has to change because the vector uh, or the approach that's coming at you is gonna be vastly different from the conventional ones that you're seeing and you're used to. Okay, uh, we can take a couple more before we come to the end, but I like this question from Zakwan Ahmad of the EPF who asks, uh, what's the difference between facts and opinions and this one is <laughs> this is going into massively dicey territory already I, not dicey in terms of the questions it's more like yes where does this one end and the other begin because it's very important that people need to know how to identify these two things before they start sharing information i believe the sky is green is that an opinion or is that a fact but how can you tell me i'm wrong when that's my opinion Something like that, right? <laughs> okay, so I had this long conversation with the Ministry of Law in Singapore as well. Um, and the complicating part, so you're assuming, okay, so let's, let's set the context, right? You're assuming that whatever piece of content that we get, it's factual uh, or 
it is purely opinion. I believe and I feel this is way this way, right? So uh, facts should be able to be proven in a court of law. Um, so in other words, it's going to go into the whole legal discussion as well. And, and the, it needs to contain things which is usually quantified. It can be proven. And it is, uh, and for example, uh, if, you, if those particular things qualify, they will fall under the fact category or the uh, facts, factual category. Um, if you're talking about opinions, it's just that, oh, I think it is good, it is bad. Um, it's my opinion. So it's a very personal thing uh, where yeah. you have a slant in it uh, where, and I know how bad actors do it. So they, they normally put a bit of facts mixed with a lot of opinions and it gets very muddled up. So we have hardly seen anyone which is purely facts. That's easy to refute. Uh, for example, if I were to ask a question, say, uh, is, are, are you good? What, what, what kind of an opinion would you be able to get? So is, is it factual or not? So it's, it's going to be in that kind of gray territory that a lot of these bad actors will play in. So if, assume that most of them will be bordering in that particular gray zone. The spectrum is very large. And if you're going to fight facts to facts, you will lose because it's about who has a better narrative. So let me, let me change this, okay? Think about this. When it comes to fighting fake news, it's about who gets the facts right, but who has a more compelling narrative. And the one with a more compelling narrative usually wins. And we've seen that happen before. You can refute it, replace it with facts, and still the older narrative is still, there's a shadow there somewhere, and the consumer will still believe the previous one that they've encountered. So you need to understand yeah. consumer behavior a lot deeper than to understand that it's not, uh, it's not in a matter of law that you can actually refute. And there was one very interesting case that happened in Singapore. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I renewed that because we raised it up quite often. How do you prove, uh, uh, say for example, someone spread, uh, you are say for a state developer, right? A estate developer. And you say that someone reported that he saw ghost sightings and you take pictures of it and they spread it around. How do you refute that in a court of law? All that, right. <laughs> you understand the whole gray area that we're talking about? Yes, yes, yes. So you can't because fight you're going that into battle. beliefs already. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. There's a lot that of things that we messed. don't know. Yes. There's a lot yeah. of things that we don't know here, and science is unable to prove a lot of things as well. So we need to be able to understand that if we go down that route, we may not be able to come up well protected, which is the intent of resilience. Oh. Okay, last question actually before we wrap up, and I think this one is very good for companies in particular. Jia Le Lu actually says, of course, it's worrisome. There's a lot of damage that we can done, but how much of a commitment by a company, a global company in terms of manpower, time and money should be invested to counter this kind of threat? Okay, so this one goes into the risk mitigation. So whenever the board looks at it right now, they look at uh, possible physical risks most of the time, right? Or disruption to business operations. Use that same lens. It is not something different. It's just that the attack vectors are different. The tools are different, but the risk that you have been managing day in, day out, in terms of what could happen to organization for disruption point of view, is the same. So if you look at how you would say, protect the organization from business operational disruption as part of risk mitigation or fraud, for example, yeah. you would have already put aside certain sum of money to actually protect against that. So just that now you need to adjust it to include the protection or resilience against possible fake news as well. And we're not talking about overhauling everything. We're talking about the only thing you need to overhaul is your perspective and your mindset. However, the rest is incremental adjustments to your current processes. It's not to jettison everything, but to actually optimize it to be relevant to the current state that we are in right now, rather than to look at it from a legacy point of view. Well, that's a fantastic way to kind of end it. So basically just bump up what we already have now or maybe change, like you said, their mindset. But yes. with that, thank you so much, Ryan, for that eye-opening presentation. Uh, with that, we've actually come to the end of the webinar for today. Thank you so much for everybody who participated and all the questions. Apologies yet again that we weren't supposed, that we didn't get to all of them because there's quite a few, uh, but your presence and your, your queries are so much appreciated. But feel please feel free to go through the chat box. There's a lot of information, interesting information there as well and a couple of active discussions. And as always, as always, always, we'd love to hear from you. Please use the survey link in the chat box. There's a QR code to scan to provide feedback and other topics of interest. Online program series is coming soon. Just keep an eye on that. 
but you can actually get a ahead of it by registering your interest at development at icdm.com.my or visit icdm.com.my and with that we are actually done for webinars for this week but we're actually back next week there is part the first part of a two-part series on monday and it's called navigating the COVID 19 crisis which is the new normal of the workforce we have speakers like shai ganu and lim chihan and tan Yuan jim thank you so much for all of your participation and i hope you have the good rest of the week see you guys <laughs>